Good morning and welcome to Subsea Connect TV, coming to you live today from Asia Pacific. My name is Derek Price from Baker Hughes in Perth, and it's my pleasure to facilitate this first panel session of our Subsea Connect event today. Subsea Connect is Baker Hughes' approach to enabling subsea developments. It focuses on four key pillars to success that cover how projects are conceptualized and executed, building on the connections from early engagement to home in on the key value drivers for customers. It looks at the most appropriate collaboration and partnership models for execution that drive efficiency and reduce interfaces and risk. And it also works on deploying the right end-to-end -end technology, including digital technology, to bring down the economic development point of a subsea project. And in all of this, we want to take a life of field or total expenditure point of view. We call that TOTEX in Baker Hughes. So we all understand today with the multiple challenges of a lower for longer market, momentum growing in the energy transition, and a global economy that's wrestling with how to manage in a COVID world, our industry is challenged in how to construct and sanction projects, particularly subsea, to deliver on time and on budget. So I'm sure we're very interested to hear what projects of the future will look like and how they may be different, what the drivers for success will be, and how our industry will adapt to the new normal. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by some great panelists from across our industry and from the APAC region. And our guests each bring a unique perspective on projects, technology, and stakeholder engagement. If I could introduce our first guest is Dr. Nazir Dahman, the Chief Technology Officer of Group Research and Technology and Project Delivery and Technology with Patronus. This role, in this role, Dr. Nazir steers all the technology activities across the Patronus Group. And of course, Patronus is Malaysia's national energy company and a major Fortune 500 corporation. Patronus operates a fully integrated global energy and solutions business with investments in conventional, unconventional and renewables, all the way down to, to downstream refining and petrochemical. Patronus has been responsible for successfully delivering a number of firsts in the industry, including the first floating energy production facility in 2017. Dr. Nazir joins us from Patronus headquarters in Kuala Lumpur, so, so welcome, Doctor. Our second guest is Mr. Shinichi Takada, the Vice President of ICTHIS Phase 2 project, or IMPEX. Takada-san oversees the extension of the ICTHIS project to tie in numerous subsea wells across multiple future campaigns and incorporate the addition of export gas compression to increase recovery and production. The ICTHIS project is one of the most complex oil and gas projects of recent times and encompassed a number of world firsts, including the world's largest semi submersible platform, one of the longest FPSOs in the world, and an 890 kilometer, 42 inch subsea pipeline, the longest in the Southern Hemisphere. The project is the single largest foreign investment by Japan and Australia. Takata-san is based in Perth and we look forward to hearing his perspective on projects of the future. Our third panelist is Ms. Claire Wilkinson. Claire is the Director for Western and South Australia for APIA. APIA is the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, which is the peak body that represents Australia's upstream oil and gas industry in Australia. APIA engages with community and government and other stakeholders and provides advocacy and helps build awareness, positive interactions and outcomes for our industry. Claire's previously worked with Total EMP, with Shell Australia, and as a senior advisor to a federal government minister in, in Australia. Claire joins us from Perth, so welcome Claire. And our final panellist is Mr Graham Gillies, Vice President of Baker Hughes Australia, New Zealand and PNG, and also a dual role uh, Vice President for oil field equipment covering subsea technology in Asia Pacific and India. And Graham is based in, in Perth, Australia as well. So our themes for discussion today focus on how our industry, particularly subsea, can stay relevant future by looking at aspects such as project delivery. How can we make projects more viable? How can we execute those successfully? What's the role of technology and how do we use it differently to be more competitive? And how will we adapt in the energy transition? And what changes do we need to make to be able to compete as an industry, particularly in the subsea space? And then final uh, theme is around talent and how do we attract and retain the brightest minds in our industry as we compete going forward? 
So to our online audience today, thank you so much for joining. Um, please feel free to submit your questions online and we'll put these to the panel members, time permitting. If we don't get time for them, we will endeavour to respond offline to those questions. So uh, feel free to comment. So without further ado, we'll commence our discussion with the panellists and talk about project delivery in unusual times. We all know that the challenges of successfully delivering mega projects has been well documented and in the spotlight in recent years. And post COVID, we know that there's been struggles in the industry to get projects sanctioned. Could you please share with us some of your thoughts on how your company and the industry will look to change the way projects are put together and executed? And perhaps to cut aside, if I could ask you your thoughts on that subject first, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Derek. Um, my name is Shinji Takada. I'm a vice president phase two for Ixis. And yeah, the the COVID-19 has been very uh, challenging uh, event for us. And uh, we started uh, Ixis phase two A project um, last year. And uh, we we have uh, roughly completed one third of the project execution. And with the uh, Baker Hughes and McDermott as a, a major EPC contractor for us. And actually it's been very successful uh, and uh, despite the COVID-19 impact, the uh, both contractors have been working very well to uh, tackle with all the challenges with COVID-19 and uh, managing the uh, global supply chain very well. So the, I think the key key to the success is the very close communication between the Impex and the uh, uh, Baker Hughes and McDermott. So that we, we've been working together and uh, it's been very successful. Thank you, Takata-san. And uh, Dr. Nadia, would, would you mind uh, giving your perspective from Patronus in terms of uh, future projects? Uh, thanks, Derek. Uh, let me put this way. Uh, for Petronas, of course, this COVID-19, uh, we are slowing down our project as well. So there are a lot of projects that is borderline being KIV, but any, uh, but we, 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 we have all the uh, ingredients to make sure all the things that we already committed, we deliver it efficiently. Uh, so in this case, uh, there are a few projects currently ongoing and we need to make sure that all the projects are best in class uh, uh, across the business. Yeah. Uh, in that case, uh, Petronas has embarked on a program uh, on what we call project management of the future. Yeah. Uh, there are four main components uh, inside that uh, project management of the future. Uh, first is uh, digital transformations. So uh, we are leveraging more and more on digitals. Uh, uh, as much as we can, uh, we are putting out uh, 5G connections uh, in in our new projects. Uh, we are putting up uh, so that we can control it from onshore for all offshore operation, uh, so that we can, to a certain extent, we can safe uh, safeguard our our staff from sending them uh, to offshore, and then uh, we remote operate the whole the whole facilities from, from onshore. So, uh, so Petronas is basically going through a very rapid phase of uh, digital transformations, and that will be here to stay uh, inside project management scope. Second, uh, we also adopt a construction-based engineering uh, through process improvement and elimination of wastage and non-value adding activities. So anything that we can simplify we cut the costs and simplify it. But one rule of thumbs is that HSE is non negligible. Uh, all the things that we do must meet the requirement of HSE. Uh, but anything that we can simplify, we simplify. Uh, smart project side, uh, uh, remote delivery of project by leveraging IoT, like I said, uh, uh, and, and resource optimization. So uh, I just give you one example. Uh, where I will supply uh, to the project site, uh, to the people requirement. Uh, currently, we basically deploy a, a technology uh, that basically can tra trace uh, and track where you are so that we can uh, we can have a tracing people movement. Uh, 
uh, this is on the purpose of COVID-19. So in the case that any of our staff is uh, proof uh, to be uh, to, to, to have COVID, we can only quarantine a specific person that that guy need, not the whole team. So by doing that, we basically uh, manage how to uh, uh, make the people under quarantine uh, manageable uh, in this environment. So, so the whole website are very uh, IoT based now. Second one is uh, we also look into so all our project managements uh, have to think about sustainability from the beginning, rather than while we operate that uh, uh, asset. Yeah. So uh, sustainability is one of the important factor that we are talking right now, and that being translated in the whole value chain of Petronas activity, including project management. So that four component basically describe our uh, project management of the future in Petronas. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. That's a great perspective. I think uh, digital has shown us new ways to do everything from uh, remote drilling through to operations and, uh, you know, coping with COVID has, has allowed us to, to continue operation in, in ways we, we have, haven't thought of before. So it's, it's been a real prompter for, for new applications. Thank you for that. Um, Claire, could I, could I get, uh, I guess, an industry-wide view on, uh, on projects of the future? What will they look like? Um, an APS perspective, please. Well, thanks, Derek. Um, I think from an industry association perspective, so our role is very much in the regulatory and policy space, um, and that's really to ensure that the operating environment that um, our companies and the in industry more broadly is operating in is as conducive as possible. So. I think in the post-COVID environment, in terms of getting new projects put together and uh, executed, um, it's going to be even more critical to ensure that we've got that right sort of in, uh, regulatory environment um, that's conducive to investment and enabling new projects. Um, I think for Australia, um, what we've been promoting as APA is, is having a simple and competitive taxation re regime and also some further regulatory reform into the areas like environmental approvals uh, and emissions reduction um, to assist our investment going forward. Um, it's also a bit of an opportunity in this post-COVID era to um, reconsider Australia's commercial landscape um, and ensure that where when industries are prepared to invest, that they invest in Australia um, and that we can secure that next wave of oil and gas developments here. Um, after um, an extensive development over the last decade. Um, and then I guess the, the last thing around the post-COVID um, project world, if you like, is just to, um, to make it clear that natural gas is going to remain very important um, to both the Australian energy landscape, but also that of the region. Um, we very much have an ongoing role to play um, as um, governments look to lower their emission um, energy mix. Great, thank you, Claire. And, and Graham, what, you know, your perspective. What are you seeing in, in terms of projects and uh, and the key drivers to to get projects sanctioned, which are different from from how we've seen in the past? Yeah, thanks, Derek. And, and look, I'll touch on a couple of points by by the other panelists. I think, look, our, our industry is traditionally quite conservative, and uh, what I mean by that is, you know, we we are quite transactional in the way that we do business. And I think if you look outside of the oil and gas sector. You will see many other industries partner, collaborate, engage early in order to realise common outcomes. And I think, you know, over the last 10 years, if you look at major projects, there has been potentially cost overruns, there's been schedule issues. And I think when you look at examples where partnership is adopted early and the engagement process between industry operators and key technology companies comes together, you see a far more valuable outcome for the overall project. And I think, you know, there's examples out there now as that's been adopted. I think we have to accelerate that. I think as an industry, we've all got an opportunity to accelerate that engagement process of how we engage early in the project. We make it where we adapt technology and the outcome early to reduce risk, both for the people that are supplying into the project, but also for the end outcome of the operator who will then own the assets at the end of it. So. I think we've got a huge responsibility 
to bring that and accelerate it. At the same time, I think it'll help us when we think about the energy transition. You know, if we can execute projects in the space we're in, in today under the constraints we're in, it only means going forward we'll have better outcomes for the overall energy uh, industry for the future. So there's some really good bright spots out there. We do still deal with each other quite transactionally, but there is some projects out there in Takarasan touched on the work in the partnership between uh, Inpex, McDermott and, B and Baker Hughes, which is bearing some some considerable uh, outcomes for, for Inpex. And at the same time, you know, you watch Petra and us collaborating very heavily with, with industry in order to make sure its projects are successful. We've got to continue that movement forward. Okay. And then, Graham, you know, maybe if we could just uh, close with, you know, a, an explanation from your point of view. What sort of leadership do we see is needed by operators in, in this new world? And then, you know, more collectively as an industry. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, talking as an energy technology company, you know, what, what we invite is that opportunity to engage early. I think, you know, the, the cycle of, you know, a project gets identified, it then goes to what would be a traditional ITT to then simply go into some form of cost competitive uh, clarification process to then end up being awarded doesn't necessarily yield the best outcome for anybody. And I think if we engage early, and then it can still be competitive, we engage early, we reduce the risk at that early engagement phase, we then adopt technology that's fit for purpose for that project to then be successful in execution. That will be a huge mind, mindset shift for for uh, the industry and the operators. And I think, you know, if the operators continue to be open to that, I think they're going to get fantastic results from from that early engagement process. Great, thanks, Grant. Okay, maybe if we could move to our next theme, which was around the role of technology and um, in the current environment, how do we see sub-C remaining viable as a development concept? Uh, Dr. Nazir, would, would you mind uh, giving your view from a Petronas perspective around subsea and, and uh, the technology, the role of technology in future projects and their viability? Well, oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, this is basically my role in Petronas to make sure that we are fully connected and make sure whatever technology that we use basically bring values to the company. Uh, in terms of subsea, uh, we are basically changing our philosophy. Uh, most of the time, people are basically talking about uh, subsea basically for deep water. Yeah. Uh, and we are basically testing it now and try to make it even for shallow water. Uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are doing subsea, uh, not only the water, but the whole, the whole factory, the separation, the storage, the, the the compression, everything is upsea. Uh, what we believe is that uh, uh, by doing it, uh, we can manage the OPEX a little bit more better uh, compared to our existing platform. Yeah, we have a lot of experience using as existing platforms, but we believe now is the time if we can manage the cost, uh, see might offer a better option even for shallow water development. So we have a full program uh, to make sure that we're able to do that. And our target is basically to reduce our operational costs while maintaining our tax by 50% uh, in the next four to five years, yeah, uh, compared to whatever we are having right now. So uh, so we are, we are putting up a lot of programs uh, to, to do that. And uh, one, one of the things that I want to highlight is that uh, collaboration is very important. Uh, I, I don't think Petronas be able to handle everything uh, uh, by ourselves. You know, uh, I think it's a waste of time and effort to develop the technology from zero. Uh, so I, I, I personally do not believe that. Uh, I, I personally believe collaborations, uh, fast option, uh, and uh, have some courage to have a, 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 a trial and learn from that and then grow. You know, agile techniques is, is the way of the way to go uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Uh, if we wait until everything is perfect, 
I don't think uh, you will even fly in a very big manner. So, uh, so, so we need we we need agile, we need fast, uh, fail fast uh, technology, and basically very open uh, at the end of the day to make sure that we can deliver uh, our our promise to make sure that the company stay relevant uh, until 100 more years to come. Great. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, really good perspectives. I think that collaboration as well as the agility uh, is a key uh, theme that um, the industry is, is fast adopting and uh, some some of the traditional barriers we've had have been broken down. There's, there's no doubt about that. Thank you. All right, um, Takata san could I ask you for your, your thoughts on the role of technology um, for the future, particularly subsea? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think subsea technology is uh, very important, and uh, even in in this very difficult uh, environment, uh, for from uh, Impex Australia point of view, we have built very expensive facilities two facilities offshore and uh, one big uh, onshore energy plant in Darwin. And uh, it's, it's unfortunately, it's uh, producing very well. But uh, for the future um, expansion or, or maintaining the plateau, subsea technology is, is very important. And uh, this is what we are doing in the phase 2A. And uh, we are uh, continuing to do this uh, through to the end of the uh, exist development and and the particularly the, the important thing is the subsea tie back and we have very good infrastructure structure and uh, we need to utilize this um, uh, very good facilities and then maintain the plateau and uh, to expand our, our uh, business in Australia and we have very good opportunities uh, in uh, Australia and we have a plan to uh, you know, you, utilizing the subsea technology and to have to make the long distance asset make um, make the long distance asset uh, feasible. So um, that's that's the very important area for Impex in in the future uh, Australian business growth. Thank you, Carlson. Yeah, and Graham, you know, from a supplier perspective, I guess a, a lot of times most advances are made during tough times and uh, you know we have to get creative we have to be bold um, from a supplier perspective can you give your thoughts on you know whether technology can still be advanced in uh, in challenging times like we have at the moment yeah no look it's a great point Derek and I think look I think we're, again we come from an industry that likes to engineer uh, you know, there's a, there's a mini engineer in all of us in, in, in the subsea space and, and we love to tinker around the edges. And I think that tinkering has somewhat got us to a position where, you know, we, we supply bespoke equipment every day, all day long sometimes. And I think what we've got a great opportunity to do is bring a standard platform of, of subsea technologies to the industry, which allows then each operator to leverage that technology platform reducing the risk, but getting for the subsea industry technology players, repeatability and consistency, which means we can reduce cycle times. It means we can reduce potential cost of quality and it allows us to provide predictability to projects. So I think there's a great opportunity in this current, you could almost call it mini crisis that we have to have that standard platform. And I think through Baker Hughes, you know, we have the subsea connect platform. You know, we are bringing up Tara the new technology suite, which we are looking to have a standard platform that will have modular capability. So we can still have common platform with operators, but they get some ability to, to have uh, functionality that they need for the field, but it will absolutely be predictable and it will reduce the on-time delivery and cost. And we look at that to Dr. Nazir's point, total cost of ownership, the cost of the field, also, it can be digitized. So how do we enable in this current period the digitization of the subsea infrastructure? You know, we only use today 10% of the data that comes from a subsea field to go back in and then predict how to optimize and operate that field of the future. And I think there's a huge opportunity there to digitize the, the, the subsea field of the future. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Yeah, look, I think this, you, you've touched on some points to where there's definitely things that we can change 
you know, and to that point, you know, are there things that we need to unlearn from perhaps the last 10 years of, uh, of projects, you know, the way we've approached them? Is there anything we need to seriously challenge and do differently going forward? To Carter, Sam, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've been focusing on uh, delivering the mega project like uh, Exis and that, okay, then if, if you look at the future, it will be very difficult to sanction this kind of uh, mega project with a very expensive facility. So we need to look at the um, tying the smaller asset into the existing facilities with a lower capex, with a, a more faster development and, and the low cost. And that I think we, we need to compete with other energy source. Then we need to uh, make the pro project very uh, economical. And uh, I, what you say, TOTEX is important. We, we need to reduce the CAPEX and OPEX and simplify the development and uh, make it quick. Yeah, very good point. And Dr. Your thoughts from Petronas perspective, I'm sure it's maybe similar. Uh, somehow I don't totally agree with the word island. Uh, I think it needs to be uh, connected to a better word, which is which I normally use is relearn. Uh, uh, we need learn, unlearn, and relearn, and all of that three need to be connected uh, as as a, as a total pairing. Uh, so uh, what what I see is that you know we are we are we are moving very very fast in terms of our end products. Uh, customer now they are very demanding. They want some uh, energy that is clean. They want energy that is not associated with the pollution. Uh, they want things that is uh, uh, relatively uh, easy to get and efficient compared to what we have so far. So we are running, in other words, from commodity products to a special. And in, in order for us to do that, technology is one of the way. And, and we also need to relearn what we learned in the past might not be suitable uh, anymore, and we need to relearn it into new areas. And uh, and in terms of technology, I I, I would uh, I would like to make this uh, point on our approach. Yeah. Uh, first, I would like to use again the word fail fast. Uh, uh, not wait until the technology is complete. Yeah. Uh, this is where we need to talk about the risk and basically how we're we going to mitigate the risk. Instead of trying to be perfect, fail far of the options, the risk mitigation is something that we really need to consider and really need to discuss and strike a balance uh, before we proceed with that. Uh, another one is that, uh, uh, don't be afraid of applying the technology. Yeah? Petronas, uh, for example, uh, uh, regardless of the oil price, uh, we have allocated fans a uh, certain amount of budget for technology development and technology uh, uh, applications. Yeah. So, so technology is something that Petronas believe is, is a key to get us out from these issues, uh, from this problem. Uh, second, uh, I also would like, you know, talking from operator point of view, uh, that we need to welcome technology from partners like uh, uh, Echo as well. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, as, as, as you can see, uh, like I said before, we need to be more collaborative in, in, in our way of doing things. Uh, we, we need to find many friends as possible rather than enemy. Uh, the more friends we have might produce a better result at the end of the day. Uh, so collaboration is, some, uh, is, a, is a way forward and we need to welcome changes. It is better for us to plan for the changes rather than being distracted by other people uh, using that ways. So, so if we do not distract ourselves, somebody else will. So, uh, so, so it's better for us to prepare and plan that disruption so that it brings benefit rather than uh, disadvantage uh, to the company. Thank you, Doctor. That's that's a good insight. 
and Claire, if I could ask you to, to round out this topic, um, you know, around the what, what would be the right environment to encourage industry and uh, government to work together and how can we set that up to develop the technology for the future? Well, I think it's already been touched on that collaboration and cooperation is, is usually always a, an efficient way to um, to to get ahead and that's um, also the case for developing new technologies. Um, I think the other aspect that we can work on with government is um, in this space is to make sure that the country is an attractive place to invest. And one way to look at, at how this um, could work is actually to see how it's worked well in the past. Um, APA did some work earlier this year with Woodmac to look at how the investment environment has changed in Australia and how the, the regulatory stability has changed over that period. And there's actually a clear correlation with um, uh, stable regulatory and fiscal environment being conducive to investment and, and in the sort of the last decade we've seen a lot more instability in that regard and um, and, and maybe that's uh, scared off some potential um, investors in Australia when of course we've got a lot of competition out there now as well for um, in such a sort of capital constrained world. Um, I think uh, there's also um, important in this sort of times to when they're looking at new technologies um, and working with governments is to try and encourage them not to pick winners in terms of which technologies um, should be the ones to pursue. Um, I think that's best left to you know the experts in our industry who who do have the technical know-how to determine. Um, but um, that means we need to maintain a constant dialogue with government and the regulatory authorities and, and advocate getting the fundamentals right in terms of the regulatory environment instead of having them implement a patchwork of quick fixes which um, could ultimately fail to achieve what they're looking for. Um, and then I guess um, in terms of Australia, um, we actually there are actually already quite a number of collaborations underway between government and industry and probably the most recent example is uh, the Future Energies Export um, Cooperative Research Centre, which um, was established in Perth this year. Um, and that's very much looking at the lower um, energy emission solutions um, and development of the hydrogen market. So, um, yeah, that's very much a focus for industry and government at this point. Right. Th thank you, Claire. OK, um, look, we might move to our third theme, which is around the energy transition. And, and um, perhaps we could ask each of the panellists to, to combine their responses here. So we've, we've seen that urgency is growing in the industry to do more to accelerate a response to the energy transition. Could, could we ask each of you to give your thoughts on how your company makes this a priority, uh, what the challenges are that we need to overcome, and how do we you know, redirect some of the capability and expertise we already have in our industry to support um, the energy transition? And what, what skills and technology that we have in the existing uh, portfolio are still relevant for, for the energy transition? So uh, perhaps takata san could, could you please share your thoughts on uh, the response to the energy transition? Yeah, uh, thank you. So IMPEX is uh, starting um, the renewable energy business, including uh, solar, wind, geothermal, and the CCS, everything. So, and we, we are in Australia, we are, uh, have a lot of CO2 uh, coming out of the Darwin energy plant. So we, we need to deal with this uh, CO2 emission. And we are seriously uh, thinking about CCS uh, option for, for the, um, the, the exist project. And, and we also, um, we have uh, created the new uh, department, new uh, called uh, New Energy Business Department to, to, to show that, to reinforce the team and we put more uh, resources in the new renewable energy and we, we are seriously um, uh, shifting towards the, um, the new world of uh, energy business. However, I think, uh, uh, we, we still need to uh, produce uh, energy. Energy continue to be a very important uh, energy source for, for, for the world. And we will continue um, producing, developing the energy um, resources. And uh, for, the, for our technology to be um, transferred to the new energy business, I think we have great opportunities. Um, uh, for example, CCS, CCUS, you know, that's, that's very um, similar to what we are doing. It involves uh, 
uh, drilling, uh, reservoir management, and the GNG, and uh, the EOR, the, the, the very uh, specific uh, area of expertise we have. So CCUS will be definitely our, our focus area for, for future business. And I think we, we, we have very um, strong position in, in this transition. Thank you, takata -san. Okay. And Dr. Nazir, uh, your thoughts from a Petronas perspective? You're already heavily invested in unconventionals, in uh, renewables as well. What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, to to rally the company with uh, 50,000 staff, it's not easy. Uh, so what we did is that uh, we even changed our mission and vision statement of the company. We carried out uh, our mission and vision. We changed it to statement of purpose. Uh, and our statement of purpose uh, that been launched uh, about a year ago is specifically a progressive energy and solution partner enriching life or sustainable future. So, so, so the word sustainable is basically embedded in that statement of purpose so that all the Petronas staff, wherever they are, basically subscribe to the same philosophy. Uh, we need to be a little bit more careful in our doing so that we protect the environment uh, and so on. You know, the whole aspect of sustainability. So uh, what we believe in Petronas is that uh, it's not, energy transition is not a question of if, it's a question of when. And, and what we believe is that the transition coming faster than what we expect. And COVID-19 basically put a little bit more booster uh, to the accelerations. Yeah? Uh, if, if we can see that we start with a solid coal uh, to get our energy from, and then we move to liquid oil, uh, and then we move to gas, hydrocarbon, methane, uh, and then now we are moving to uh, renewable energy. So, so that transition is happening uh, even before we start talking about energy transition now. So we are basically in the middle of the wave and we better ride that wave uh, properly. So with that, uh, Petronas basically adopt the same thing uh, like uh, Takada-san uh, uh, approach that we form a new business entity uh, talking about renewable energy and we apply acquire one of the India biggest uh, solar energy power M plus uh, and we basically adopt supply uh, majority of India you know and we bring it to Malaysia uh, uh, all the expertise that we get from uh, solar uh, another thing that we are talking about is uh, about wind uh, turbine uh, Malaysia and our operation area somehow uh, being in the equator, close to the equator, our wind is very, very uh, low. Uh, compared to, to North Sea, we are basically very quiet. Yeah, uh, But we are basically re-engineered uh, the whole wind turbine for low wind speed uh, environment. Yeah, uh, Because we believe the technology is there, it's good, uh, but, the, but the situation is not uh, suitable for us. So we re-engineered uh, or reprograms uh, uh, the whole subs, uh, the whole wind turbine, uh, so that it can be uh, producing power uh, at low wind speed. So that is a big project, and hopefully by mid of next year, uh, we have one uh, wind turbine operated uh, at our at our offshore uh, environment. Uh, if you wind turbine producing energy, but more importantly is that it also frees up a lot of gas that we use as a fuel that we use from the gas turbine. Yeah, And that is where the energy transition happens. And that is where the issues of being clean while generating money. So, so technology, uh, if we direct that thing to become clean, it's quite easy. But if we put another dimension that the whole technology that we make things clean need to be self-funded need to be uh, economic and need to be sustainable by itself. So at the end of the day, we need to make sure that anything that we do is sustainable, uh, not only on environment, but on also 
economic sense. Yeah. Uh, so so that is one of the research that we are doing so that we can we can release a lot of full gas uh, to some uh, other product that is more valuable rather than to fuels and the power for the operation can be obtained from the from the wind turbine. Uh, we also look at hydrogen. Uh, in this case, uh, Petronas has produced about half a million kilogram hydrogen now, but uh, but we are we are we are we are using a conventional steam reforming. So basically, uh, grey hydrogen. Yeah, it's a grey hydrogen. Uh, we are we are moving quickly to uh, blue hydrogen by handling all the waste that that uh, that we produce by hydrogen uh, by producing the hydrogen uh, by using the CO2 utilization. Uh, we are also having a big project on uh, CO2 sequestration CCUS. Uh, so the, the 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 full scope of CCUS is very important to Petronas from grey to blue. And I'm in the in the technology group also have a focus on uh, green hydrogen. Yeah. So we are we are we are trying to 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 transition Petronas from grey to blue to green. Uh, uh, so that we our 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 carbon numbers. Uh, Become become reduced, yeah. And uh, about two months ago, just to let you guys know that uh, Petronas board has approved uh, and, and Petronas president has announced that Petronas wants to be zero carbon 2050. So all the initiatives that we are we are we are putting now we need to consider that we need to be a net zero carbon. Anything that we produce, we need to make sure that we give it back. Uh, or saw it properly handle it so that net uh, carbon that we produce is, is zero. Uh, so that is the task, but we like it or we don't like it. We have to swallow that pill so that we become healthier in the future. Thank you, Doctor. That, that's really some ambitious and challenging goals that you've set yourself and uh, you're obviously exploring all the technology required to, to achieve that. So thank you. And Claire, from an industry-wide perspective, you know the energy transition is a massive theme with uh, government, with the general community, and you're, you know, responsible for um, advocating on behalf of the industry uh, amidst the, that uh, public sentiment. So, can you give us some thoughts on, you know, how um, you're managing on behalf of the industry to to drive those messages and perceptions in the wider community? Yeah, well, I think, um, first of all, I mean, reducing emissions has actually been a focus of the industry for, for many years. It's not something we've just woken up to. And as, and, and as Dr. Nadir has just said, um, you know, looking at net zero emissions options in, in the next decades is, is um, a target for many companies in um, the oil and gas industry now. Um, I think it's also really important to just acknowledge that looking at the energy transition um, to a lower emissions future, particularly in terms of natural gas, doesn't mean that we're transitioning away from our industry altogether. So we'll need natural gas as part of that energy mix for some decades. Um, and so it's, it's making the case for how um, natural gas can support and partner other technologies as they become commercially viable is really important. In terms of what the biggest challenge is to, to getting a successful transition in the policy space, I think um, the main trouble we maybe have, particularly in Australia, is um, there seems to be a lot of policy competition out there in, in lowering emissions. So, for example, we have um, federal policy, then we have state policy. Um, sometimes they can be quite duplicative um, and uh, just add to the confusion, if you like, of, of how companies should approach this issue. Um, I'd actually probably say mostly companies are, are ahead of government in this space. They're, they're probably more proactive in looking at reducing emissions altogether. Um, so, yeah, I think um, the other point just to note is that obviously exploring hydrogen um, as a technology um, that will trans help transition to a lower energy mix is a real priority of many of the companies in Australia and many of APS members. Um, and we obviously see that as a natural fit in terms of the expertise and technological know-how that we already have in our industry. So, so we're very supportive of that and, and looking to engage government on it because government's um, also very excited and energised in this area. Great, 
Thanks, Claire. And, and Graham, um, quickly, have, have you got some closing thoughts around the energy transition and response uh, from the industry? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, specifically from a Baker Hughes perspective, you know, we, we've set a vision to be 50% reduction by 2030 and carbon neutral by 2050. And I think, you know, we were one of the first companies in our sector to do that. Uh, and we're well on our way. You know, we've already recorded a 31% a reduction in our carbon footprint by changing the way that we work and changing how we serve our customers. And so that's been really encouraging uh, to do that. And I think we think about it in three themes, Derek. You know, we think about transforming the core, we think about investing for growth, and then we think about positioning for new frontiers. And the, the, the piece that we're very interested in right now is how you transform the core associated with the energy transition and, and getting to carbon neutral, which is bringing technology which has a lower footprint, which doesn't need so much work in the installation and subsea, doesn't need so much logistics cost, can, can truly reduce its own footprint. And I think that's what our first priority is, is really reducing the footprint of our current product and technology portfolio to allow customers to be able to reduce their own footprint. And then when we think about investing for growth, it's really investing in those products that will move towards the energy transition. So if you think about non-metallics today, our industry in oil and gas is heavily reliant on uh, metals. And today, really, we need to be more uh, looking towards non-metallics. And in our uh, current portfolio, we have a number of non-metallic uh, capabilities, which were trialing in Saudi uh, and we're trialing in North America, which would replace metallic materials for the future, significantly changes how you think about carbon footprint in a company like Baker Hughes, but also how we serve our customers. And then positioning for new frontiers is really about hydrogen, CCUS. You know, we're already tested successfully in, in Europe, uh, the latest hydrogen power turbine, 100% utilization of hydrogen. Uh, first time it's been done. Uh, in the industry. So that has been very exciting for us. And then CCUS, I mean, we currently serve the Gorgon project for our compressors and, and some of our other technology, which is just past 3 million tonnes of re-injected carbon uh, into Barrow Island. So there's existing technologies, existing cap capability. I think we can accelerate what we do today. And then, you know, on the question of talent and people, We'll still need engineers, we'll still need HSE people, we'll st still need commercial people. All of the skills that we have today in oil and gas are the greatest foundation possible for how we transition to uh, a lower carbon future, but also how we position for the energy transition. So, you know, anybody that's in our industry today has got the basic key skills needed for that energy transition to be successful. Yeah, thanks, Graham. And you've segued nicely into our final topic, which is around talent. You know, how do we uh, attract the best talent to solve all these challenging problems for the future? Um, and, and what's each company doing to, to address that? So perhaps, Doctor, if you, if you could give a Patronus perspective, we'll combine the, the two questions around that, as well as how we attract, you know, a, a younger, more diverse population to the industry in order to give us the, the ability to tackle these challenges of the future. Yeah. Uh... Uh, thanks, Derek, for the questions. Uh, capability development is, or, or, or talent management in Petronas is a very big subject. Uh, I cannot in words, but uh, we spend a lot of money and effort quickly to develop our, our talent. Uh, uh, we start by developing our own universities. Uh, we have a, a university that called University Technology Petronas, uh, basically, basically it's a 100% it's owned by Petronas, but the, but the student that we take is not only for Petronas, we basically open it up. But, but of course, uh, we have the first right of refusal because we control the universities. Uh, we also provide a lot of professor and lecturer uh, uh, to, to the university itself from our own staff. So that our staff, uh, senior staff, can basically uh, teach at the universities and basically make sure that they get a critical aspect of knowledge rather than 100% uh, theoretical knowledge. So, uh, so, so university programs we start from that. Uh, we sometimes go a bit below uh, to the schools uh, students so that they can choose oil and gas. You know, uh, first. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, assumptions that oil and gas is a is a sunset industry. Uh, is an industry that is very dirty and made the world dirty. Uh, we we try to change that. We try to change that. You know uh, that we can live together with with the with the product that we produce. Uh, and the product that we produce basically make the life, the quality of life become better of all. Yeah. So so uh, we are we are giving some educations uh, even from the high schools to the university. And then when they join Petronas uh, for example, we have a very specific uh, skill group event. This this is this is a group of people that basically manage all the capability development in us. And what, what we believe is that we need to uh, accelerate stuff from junior to uh, what we call autonomy in decision making. Uh, we need to shorten the period of that to achieve that stage. So we are, we are providing, uh, providing a course, providing a training, uh, even on the job attachment uh, to this stuff. Uh, to this stuff. To achieve what we believe, uh, uh, they should they, they they should go and and obtain, yeah. So so that is one program. Uh, another one that uh, Petronas is very heavy also, like I said in my first uh, uh, point, that uh, energy uh, uh, digital transformation is very big also in Petronas. So. Uh, from from a uh, from a business that I'm talking about, uh, uh, I'm coming from uh, from a vision that called project delivery and technology of Petronas. Uh, about five thousand plus people over there. Uh, in the first year alone, uh, starting of last year, uh, we basically register about thousand, which is about forty percent of our staff to this uh, analytical translator program. Yeah, so uh, doesn't matter who you are, you are finance guy, you are HR guy, you are researcher, scientist, engineer, project manager. Uh, we are offering to, to, to the whole programs so that they become okay. what is what is uh, analytics uh, translator all about. You know, they understand what is artificial intelligence means, you know, what is a concept of artificial intelligence. Uh, Moving from uh, reactive to predictive to prescriptive, uh, prescriptive uh, and so on. So, so we want our people very comfortable with data and make a decision based on the data rather than uh, assumption. Yeah. So, so, so it's a it's a data based decisions. Uh, uh, we need all the people to be razor razor sharp making their decisions and, and and that is what we see so talent is 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 very very good uh very very important in Petronas and we will continue doing what we are doing so far because we can see the the benefit coming uh right now um Petronas uh for your is being chosen as the as best company in Malaysia uh in in, in handling people so 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 we need to continue what we are doing well and basically enhance uh, from that point so that we can make sure Petronas stay relevant uh, to the industry for a long, long time from now. Thank you, Thank you Doctor. Yeah, and uh, Claire, could could I ask you to to comment on um, you know talent for an industry as as a whole? How are we attracting more diverse and um, you know the best talent that we can to the industry? I think just as Dr. Nazir said, one of the things we have to combat and one of the things that we work on quite a lot in terms of our advocacy, particularly with community, is um, addressing that concept of um, uh, oil and gas being a sunset industry. So it's, it's really um, making sure that younger people as they leave school and go through university or go through vocational training um, understand the opportunities and um, the longevity of, of our industry, particularly here in Australia, given you know, many of our assets will have decades of, of operating life still to go and, and new projects will be coming on stream as well. Um, I think in terms of attracting a more diverse um, audience and maybe retaining that, um, that group, that cohort of um, workforce, I think it's also really important that leadership teams reflect diversity as much as possible as well. Um, I think that's, that's a real um, 
signal, if you like, to all people in, a, in an organisation um, that um, they can also, also succeed and are valued for their views. No, that's brilliant, thank you. And, and Graham, just quickly, from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I touched on a couple of points there. Like, I think we're probably not seen as the most attractive industry to come into, you know, but, I, you know, the challenge I would give to the younger community uh, out there and, and the talent of the future is come and make a difference. Uh, I think in the oil and gas industry, we'll have a huge opportunity to transform who we are and what we do. And I think as we move into the energy transition, come at the oil and gas sector today, learn the foundation skills you need in order to be successful to then move that energy transition forward and be big, be a part of that big change that needs to happen in, in the energy transition and climate change, because this industry is the industry will, that will ultimately make it happen. And we're, you know, we need the energy, whether we like it or not, we need energy, we need oil and gas. Every product, whether it be an iPhone, whether it be the car you drive, whether it be you know, the clothes that you wear has some form of petrochemical attached to it somehow. And I think, you know, coming into the industry, you'd learn more about that. But what a great opportunity for a young person to come in and really transform the energy landscape for the future. It's a really exciting time to come in. Yes. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Graham. OK, we're running out of time now. And I guess if I could just ask our, our panellists to help conclude the, the segment in one sentence, how would you describe what you focus on to make the energy and subsea industry relevant and viable for the future. Uh, Doctor, would you mind um, perhaps giving us your thoughts, please? Uh, let, let, let me summarize into four points. And uh, first is that open mindset uh, and welcome technology. Second is uh, sustainability must be part of our action. Uh, reducing carbon footprint, minimizing capital and operation. So that is that basically summarizes what I'm trying to say uh, this morning. Great, thank you, Doctor. And uh, I think Takata Sun's got an audio problem, so I think we might need to skip Takata Sun. But Claire, would you mind giving us your thoughts, please? Yes, I, I guess I've got two points. <laughs> One is that um, we need to continue to work with government to maximise the opportunity to develop our current resources um, and um, new resources. Uh, responsibly to power our way of life. But the second point is to also ensure that we've got the policy settings right for our industry to expand into those new energy technology areas um, and contribute even more to a lower emission future. Brilliant, thank you. And Graham? Yeah, I, th I think a summary of all, right? It's a, you know, partnership, collaboration and engagement is going to be key now and in the immediate future. I think the adoption of fit for purpose technologies and capabilities moving into the future with our key partners is also relevant and then attract and diverse uh, and enable talent that wants to be in the industry and make a difference Th those are the three key themes that we're focused on for baker hughes yes i think you've summarized the the morning session very nicely and saved me doing it graham that's that's brilliant around collaboration agility um being faster uh, that's that's certainly a theme that's rung through and, and change is happening very fast and, and to Dr Nazir's point, wanting to be on the front foot and proactively addressing that change as an industry front on. So um, we're at the end of the hour. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining. We really appreciate the uh, panellists joining, Dr Nazir Dharman, uh, Mr Shanitia Takata and Ms Claire Wilkinson, as well as Mr Graham Gillies. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we really appreciate it to the audience. Thank you. Unfortunately, we didn't get time for questions, uh, but we will respond offline to those. We have a tech talk commencing at 11.15, Perth, Singapore and KL time, uh, and another two sessions in the afternoon. So feel free to, to attend those and uh, also attend the Solutions Fair as well. And thank you very much on Baker Hughes' behalf for attending Subsea Connect TV. Thank you.